So, infection rates at the highest level since the ONS survey began in May. Over 17,000 new cases a day and hospital admissions are at the highest level since March. Professor Anthony Brooks from the University of Leicester uh, is with us tonight. Anthony, good evening to you. Good evening. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's nice to talk to you. And Dun Duncan, Dr. Duncan Robertson from Loughborough University. Hello, Hi, Duncan. Good evening, Hi. good evening. So, local lockdowns, they're not quite working, Duncan, are they? Would you support a nationwide so-called circuit breaker across the UK? And if so, how long would it need to last? Well, I think the point is, as we are all beginning to realise, you know, this epidemic is uh, getting into this exponential stage, it's going up, and we need to, to stop it. <laughs> uh, you might say, why do we need to stop it? Because, as you said, you know, the beds are getting uh, uh, full in hospitals, intensive care places are getting filled, and deaths are going up as well. And we definitely need to do something. And, and the point is, you know, what do we do uh, is really kind of dependent on the sort of approach we, we, we take. So, you know, we could lock down everything, but then what are we going to do? I mean, the point is really fundamental to coming out of the national lockdown was we have this test and trace system, you know, the whole whack-a-mole thing where you go and, and basically stamp down on the virus where it is. But the problem that that's, that's failing, not only testing, tracing and isolating. So the whole system doesn't work. So people are still... Uh, you know, going to spread the virus. So we really need to do something about that. And what's the solution? Well, the solution is that um, this whole test trace, this NHS test and trace isn't working. And, you know, the reason it's not working is the people who are running it aren't experts. They're process people. They set out, you know, charts and flow charts and this sort of stuff. But they're not the experts. They're not the people who are you know, in local authorities. So every local authority has a director of public health who's an expert, not only in the epidemiology, but also an expert in knowing what their local authority is, where the virus is, what sort of communities are there. And really, you know, and Public Health England, that's the other thing, they have experts in the regional teams who know everything about this. And the problem is the government's decided to set up this sort of parallel system full of people who just don't really know what they're doing. They know how to, you know, process, I don't know, selling mobile phones or that sort of thing. But they're not really experts in how to stop disease. And we need to get the expertise back. We need to get the people who know what they're doing in charge. So obviously track and trace, that system is what you're preferring, Duncan. But do you think further lockdown measures are necessary? Well, I think we need to do something because if we don't, uh, we're going to get a whole lot of deaths. So in the middle of July, the um, chief scientific um, uh, uh, advisor um, set out a report, and this is, was set out by the Academy of Medical Sciences, and this is, you know, there are some very clever people there. It's basically the Royal Society of Medics. And, and what was said is the reasonable worst-case scenario of deaths is 119,000, and that sort of doubled the number of deaths in the first wave. So that's, that's really what could be coming. And I suppose, you know, what, what you need to ask the politicians, because, you know, advisors and scientists advise, but politicians decide. And you need to ask them what's their reasonable worst-case scenario number of deaths. And, and if they don't know that number, why not? Are they sort of just getting policy and responding to, you know, the latest opinion polls? Because that's not the way to stamp down uh, in a pandemic. Let me focus, Professor Anthony Brooks, with you for a moment on the lockdown measures that we're all wondering, um, what are they going to be? They seem to be imminent. You don't think tighter lockdown measures are necessary. Tell us why, Anthony. Uh, um, well, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, I think... So, so uh, first, uh, full respect to Duncan and his views, and I agree with a lot of what he said. But I'd like to just um, bounce back on a couple of the points, which really will explain why I have a different view. Um, he said we're entering the exponential phase. Careful studies of the data show that we have been in the exponential phase. That exponential phase is now tailing off, and the curves are starting to flatten on their own. In London... We're actually already today have a R value of less than one. 
So, and in the if you go down to the the, the southwest, the southeast, the infection rates are so incredibly low there, and again they're not rising particularly highly. So, the idea of a, some big national uh, lockdown or circuit breaker is just too much of a, a crude approach. So, it's not that I don't think we should do. No, it's not that I'm saying we should do nothing. I just let it let rip. Um, but I think we can also. Um, do things in a more nuanced, intelligent way instead of just a blanket lockdown. And why do you think the rates are falling in London? Well, <laughs> um, it's that word that you knew, I guess you knew I was going to say tonight, herd immunity. Uh, or a nicer phrase might be collective immunity. Uh, if you look at the way the pandemic spread back in the spring, um, it hit London first quite a lot earlier than elsewhere. And the, uh, the prevalence, the level of the virus went very high compared to other places. Um, it then started to spread to other places, but then we did lockdown. So at that point in time, the whole country went into lockdown you know, at the same time in the same way. So you would expect the virus to start falling in all places equally. That's not what happened. In London, it fell like a stone dramatically, and it fell far, far lower than it did elsewhere. So you have to explain why that happened. There was something else was going on. It wasn't just lockdown, suppressing the virus. Something else was going on. And the only difference between London and the other places was the fact that it had had much more chance to gather herd immunity. And last point, there was one other place up north where they also they had an earlier, um, a very early infection. So they had the same sort of level as infection as in London, and they also fell very fast and very low. That place up north and London are also today not rising the way, the way it is up elsewhere up north. So all of these pieces of evidence strongly suggest to me that um, herd immunity is a real thing. It is at play here. Now, I'm not arguing we then just sit back and let herd immunity solve the problem. We do have to take measures. We do have to do suppression, but we just need to target it cleverly and not just do a blanket suppression across the whole country, which will hurt a lot of businesses. But but is herd immunity, Professor Brooks, just a a, a, a euphemism um, mm, for well well for the reality that if you do let this virus spread, it will mm. actually end up being beneficial in the long run, because that's 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 essentially what's now happening in London. There were bigger infection yes. rates in London, and London yep. is now benefiting from that because the yep. figures are going down. So yep. is that actually what we're looking at here? Uh, yes, it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, the way I think of this is, is like a, a balance, a scales. Um, on one side of the balance, you have the virus trying to spread. That's the weight on one side of the scales. On the other side of the scales, you have suppression that we can do, and you have herd immunity working together. Now, what's important to realize is with time, the suppression becomes less and less effective as a force because people get fed up with it, because businesses start to, the, and the economy starts to suffer and fail. Uh, other healthcare doesn't, doesn't happen. So we can only do lockdowns for so long, with time they become less effective. So we have to allow herd immunity, which actually then becomes stronger with time, naturally, to counterbalance that. So with time we'll need to do less and less lockdown, less and less suppression, because we will naturally acquire more and more herd immunity. The problem is if you do too much lockdown, you don't give the herd immunity a chance to form. Do you agree, Duncan? No, absolutely not. I mean, uh, herd immunity is the sort of thing you do when you're sort of treating pigs in a... Uh in a you know a sty you know the idea is that there is a certain amount of immunity amongst the, the population um you know this sort of population immunity doesn't really apply unless you're thinking about a vaccine and of course if you vaccinate a lot of people then yes you do get herd immunity but you don't kill as many people in the process and i think that's the point that we we you know for, for people who are thinking about those sort of strategies i go back to my earlier question what is your reasonable worst case scenario number of deaths you know, how many people will die under that strategy? And uh, mm -hmm. if, if you can't answer that question, why not? So are you just going to sort of have a strategy of kind of hoping and, and you know, letting it spread through the population? Um, because if you don't know how many people will die, that, that's quite a risky strategy. And of course, you know, we're talking about it, it spreading in things like universities, but 
it also spreads up to the older population. So if you look at the you know, public health England figures that came out um, yesterday, uh, you've know, got um, you know, basically 1,000 people over 80 caught the disease uh, last week. And that basically means 100 of those will die. And because that's just the infection fatality rate amongst uh, older people. And, you know, if you allow the virus to spread, then you'll just get hundreds and hundreds and thousands of more people dying. And that's the question you have to answer. How many of that is, is acceptable? And I think the other point is this is discussed as a northern problem, is the north. But, of course, you know, what we had is we had a threshold for getting into these sort of uh, watch list and where you have intervention measures. And every London borough is above that threshold, uh, using the figures that have come in the last week. It's more than 50 cases per 100,000. And so really there are very few places left in the country where it's at these very low levels. So, you know, how many people will die is the question. And, uh, and of course, Professor Brooks, mm. herd immunity is surely dependent on our bodies retaining those antibodies or retaining immunity after we've yeah. got COVID. Yeah. Do we know enough about this virus and the human body's reaction to it to be sure that if we've got it, we remain immune to it? Great question. We can't be sure of anything we're discussing the, this evening. We're all, you know, making our best guesses based on what we know, what we've seen in other viruses. Um, so, so this uh, COVID virus is, the name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2. It's named number two because there was one before it called SARS-CoV, which generally just referred to as SARS. That was 17 years ago. It's obviously a very, very similar virus, same family, very similar. Uh, we know that people who had that virus 17 years later do have immunity. Um, that's a T cell based immunity, a certain type of immunity. Another type of immunity is the. Sorry, they have immunity for how long? Sorry. Seven, that was 17 years ago, and people do still have immunity after that much time. That's the T cell type of immunity. The alternative immunity is B cells, that's the antibody one, and we know that does fade. So, yes, that fades within a few months, but it's. There's no reason to assume that that's the, the basis of herd immunity. In fact, a lot of people fight off this virus without even creating antibodies. They just use the T-cell immunity, which we know in the case of SARS does last for 17 years. That doesn't prove that it's through for this virus, but it makes it highly likely. Can I just add one quick thing as well, which is really important, I think, um, to, to what my colleague said about um, vaccines and herd immunity. I, I fully agree. What vaccines we want them to do is to add more herd immunity to the population. Um, but the unfortunate reality is these kind of vaccines for these kind of viruses, they're generally not designed or not able to create immunity. They're much more um, focused on just reducing symptoms, the severity of symptoms. And that's a major problem for obvious reasons. So in other words, that's a ticking time bomb. What you will be having is uh, people who will not need to enter hospital because the symptoms are being suppressed, but they will still be infectious, passing it on to other people. Is that what you're saying? I'm, I'm really impressed that you picked that up so quickly. That is a possible scenario, but it's equally possible that because you suppress symptoms, you also suppress the level of virus in them, and they may not be um, spreading virus as much as others. So we just don't know. There's too many unknowns. But the idea that the, the simplistic idea that we lock everything down and, and just accept all the harm to the economy in the meantime, because at some time some vaccine is going to come along, which will create herd immunity for everybody, that's just, that's just scientific gobbledygook. It's not realistic. So we have to look at the whole um, tools that we have in the toolbox. Suppression when we need it. We do need suppression up north, absolutely now. Um, we do need to shut bars at times. Um, we need to use track and trace. We need to use vaccines to the extent we can. But we also need to let enough of the very safe younger people interact, get the virus to build up herd immunity. So it's a combination of all of those used in a balanced way. So am I getting my head around this right? Sorry, because, I, you know, I, I, I'm sorry to be asking basic questions, but I sure. actually think, you know, I have a, an, an average knowledge, as, as most listeners and if others have more knowledge than me, fair enough. But it, do, does logic then follow, Professor Brooks, in, in, in your thesis, that those areas which are the most infected now, that, mm. that, that are doing the worst now, will actually be safer areas? 
come, say, um, Christmas than other well, areas of the UK? Well, so London, because it had, I, in my view, from what I can see in the data, I can't prove this, but the data are totally consistent with the idea that London had enough infection in the first wave that it's gained now a pretty good, it's never complete, but it's got a pretty good level of herd immunity, which is why the virus is now not spreading in London. The R value is less than one, or it's one or slightly below in London from the latest um, uh, REACT study, which was published today. Um, and whereas up north, where they didn't get herd immunity, the, the, the virus has managed to take off again. Um, but yes, the implication would be that in time, up north, they will also develop a decent amount of herd immunity. And indeed, the data already look like the spread is starting to slow up north. So, what about you know, that, what? That's, well, just just that's what happens with virus. That's why the Spanish flu did, didn't come back year after year after year for the last hundred years. What about addressing Duncan Robertson's point, though, Anthony? In that herd immunity model, you know, the more people that get infected at the start, at the at, at the end of the day, there will be some people who get infected who will die from it, who will need hospital yeah. treatment, yeah. and who will die. What is, uh, you know, it's a clumsy That's, way of me putting it, but Duncan no, 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 used the words an acceptable right. level of death. So no, what is no. a, an acceptable level of death if you're pursuing herd immunity? Yeah, Duncan put his finger on a really important question. What would one expect the level of death to be from this virus? right? Um, that number was initially estimated by Neil Ferguson, as you know, to be 500,000 if we did nothing. Uh, there's been suggestions that in this second wave it could be that that level or even higher. Um, if I if I even slightly believe those kind of numbers, I would be much more in favour of much more strict lockdowns, because that's not a risk I would be comfortable to take by trying to build up herd immunity. Instead, if we look at places where they haven't, so across the globe, there's been all sorts of different approaches to this, different levels of um, uh, suppression. Um, and if you look at all of those data, um, and if you look at the computer models, and, and Duncan's a, a computer modeler, I know. So um, the, the suggestion is, and there's papers just recently published on this, we perhaps, by the lockdown we did, um, saved half of the number of deaths. So, you you know, maybe 100K deaths if we just let it rip instead of 500K or more. Um, now, I'm not suggesting we let it rip at all. Of course not. But we've now suffered 40,000 deaths. Everywhere that this second wave has happened, it's been far smaller than the first wave with far fewer deaths. So there might be another five, ten thousand 10,000 deaths. Um, and that's the kind of level that I feel I hate the idea of any of these people dying, but if that allows us to get more herd immunity so that we don't have to stay in lockdown perpetually for years and years to come, you know, that's probably the less of two evils. But but by the very nature of who this virus endangers most, Dr. Duncan mm -hmm. Robertson, that means going to be elderly people and people already with health conditions who are paying the price for the country to gain herd immunity, right? Well, I mean, yeah, absolutely. So it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't uh, attack people uniformly. So, you know, if you're black or if you're old or if you're obese, then you've got a higher chance but the, uh, of dying. And, and the one, you know, major factor is age. So the infection fatality rate, which is basically, if you get it, how likely are you to die? So sort of over 80s is about one in six. So that basically means one in six people who get it, who are 80 will die. Now, that's high, right? And uh, that's, you know, morally, is that an acceptable uh, level of people to, you know, to die? I, I, I personally don't think so. Um, but, you know, the, and, and the sort of calculations about, you know, what is likely to happen. Uh, well, 60 million people in the country... Uh, the, um, say, 80% get it under this sort of hose immunity type uh, strategy? No, no, Election. not at all. What do you say then? Um, so the different models suggest between 15% and 70%, 7-0. If you look at the number of people oh, okay. that are probably infected in London that have created a decent amount of herd immunity, it's nowhere near the 70-80%. I'm not going to say it's 15-20%, but it's probably somewhere in the middle. Mm, OK, fine. Uh, just hold mm -hmm. it then. So um, basically... Mm -hmm. Uh, whatever it is, it's hundreds of thousands of people dying. And uh, as I say, the Academy of Medical Sciences prediction, well, sorry, worst case, reasonable worst-case scenario, to be specific, about 119,000 people. That's excluding people in care homes. And this whole kind of uh, 
discussion about uh, it's not in London. Well, I, I, I won't say it, but I'll tell you what, what's happening in London. So in the last week, uh, in Redbridge, there have been 141 uh, uh, cases per 100,000. Hackney, 148 cases per 100,000. And remember, you know, what does that mean? Well, the whole idea was we'd have these interventions, these sort of local lockdowns, happening at around 50 cases per 100,000. So basically every local authority in London has a case, has, has an incident more than 50 per 100,000. So the, the, the sort of discussion that's not in London or, you know, it's not at high levels in London, it is in high levels and it's rising exponentially. And, of course, you know, if you start off at a low level, of course it's going to go up less. Then it doubles and doubles and doubles. And the thing about doubling is you get to a very large number very quickly. So can I come back quickly on that? Um, it is... Um, not going exponential, as I explained. If you look at the data that's just come out today, the R number is less than one. That means it is staying the same or reducing slightly. That's not going up exponentially. Um, you said that this IFR, 0.1%, 0.2% of people will die. Of course, we don't want um, or um, let, let's assume it's a 40% uh, people need to be infected to get herd immunity. We wouldn't want those 40% of people to be um, including the old people. That's why we would like the younger people to be mixing more now while we continue to give more uh, protection to the old so that we achieve that 40% infection amongst young people and not amongst the old people. But can I, can I just pick up on that? So, you know, we, we, we can't, we can try... Yep. But we can't, as a society, carve off older people sure. and put some ring of fence around them, uh, ring ring of steel around them, can we? Because no. it is the younger people who are going into our hospitals as porters yeah. and cleaners and doctors and nurses to care for elderly people when they're in hospital. The domiciliary care workers, people in in, in old people's homes, are often young people interacting with older people. So, Absolutely. how in your model do we? carve off those older people and and protect them. So, so yeah, the way you phrased it, I agree with you. We cannot completely isolate and protect those people. They have to interact with other people. And it's not just the old, it's, there's other type of vulnerable people as well. Um, think about it the other way around, though. Let's imagine we did it for some region of the country because the virus has spread quite badly, perhaps up north, for example. We did a, a uniform blanket lockdown, which might well be merited now up north um, for a period of time. The question is, what do we do then? Do we just wait and wait and wait until the virus has gone right down before we suddenly then let everyone out of lockdown? The alternative would be we, we do a phased release of lockdown and we phase the release for the younger people. Now, the younger people that then are released but still need to interact with the older people, we would have to make sure they have testing, regular testing. We would want to provide um, um, masks and food and other support service for the old. Um, care homes, the staff need to be tested every day. They are not being tested every day. Um, so we would need to direct efforts to easing up the lockdown on the younger people while maintaining or strengthening the lockdown on, on not only the vulnerable, but the people that interact with the vulnerable. I, I, I think you two perfect. are brilliant. It's not perfect. I think you two are brilliant tonight, by the way, because I'm, I'm learning from you both, although you disagree from each other. I'm getting more knowledge about this, just listening to the two of you. So we've lots of calls tonight, but if I can milk you for another few minutes, if that's all right, for as long as I have you with me. If you both set aside... Um, your differences about whether there should or should not be a lockdown. Can I ask you both, if there is a lockdown, how long would it need to be to be effective? Because I keep on hearing experts talking about a two-week period, but surely there's got to be an, an overlap in the incubation period. So between those people infected and those people not, you know, is a two-week period enough if we're going for it? Or actually, would it need to be up to four weeks? How effective would a four-week period be against a two-week period? Let's start with you, Dr. Duncan Robertson. Well, I suppose, you know, you've got to think about how long this, how long the various stages last. And, um, you know, from if I infect you by sort of breathing in your general direction, it might take sort of five days uh, for you to then get it. Um, and so the idea is that if you have a couple of weeks, then, uh, you know, it's going to kind of, hold things steady and you know every day we sort of prevaricate and talk about tomorrow then you know it is rising uh, at, a, at a certain rate anyway um, 
So, you know, the, this, this sort of virus doesn't take the weekend off. It's not as though it's got Friday night and it's sort of, you know, put its, uh, put its feet up and is, is taking the weekend off. No, it's, it's multiplying and it's spreading. And the other thing I think that, that's quite interesting that was in the um, uh, chief scientific officer's, um, uh, sorry, chief scientific advisor's um, uh, talk a couple of weeks ago was this thing about aerosol transmission. And that was, you know, to me, that was the big thing that was being said. The fact is, you know, people get infected by breathing in, you know, uh, the virus from other people, not in the form, form of droplets, you know, from normal speaking, but in terms of it sort of hangs around in the air. And this has real implications about, uh, you know, the way it spreads. So I think, you know, maybe maybe one, one place we can agree uh, is, is testing, right? You know, testing, tracing, isolating. Get that sorted, and then we have a much better chance of containing the virus. Anthony yeah. Brooks, any point of a lockdown, be it two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, if students at university are not included in it? <laughs> oh, what a great question. Um, so I think actually Duncan and I would probably agree on quite a lot, including the things he said. Um, it, any point, it depends on what your objective is. If you want to um, well, take up north, the virus is increasing still. You want to stop it increasing and bring it right back down to very low levels. Then you need to do a lockdown for the same time period we did last time. There's no difference, right, in that respect. Um, so what's that, sorry? Oh, so that time period, well, we did it sort of 23rd March, didn't we? And it was it was coming down dramatically um, mid-May. So, you know, it's... it's six weeks, least, wasn't it? It's at least a month, yeah. Probably six weeks to get it really down to, you know, much more comfortable levels. It still wouldn't be rock bottom. Um, but if instead your goal is just to stop it going up the way it is now, you know, just kind of just put a hold on it, which is what I think the whole point of a, of a, a circuit breaker is, then, then perhaps two weeks is enough um, because um, in that time, you know, that herd immunity would develop um, and it, the, a lot of people that are infected would, re, would resolve their infection and become non-infectious. Um, then you may get to the point where, if you think back to my um, analogy of scales, where there is enough weight on our side of the scales with a medium uh, level lockdown carrying on and herd immunity to balance the virus that's left. But, but on my question of is there any point of a lockdown uh -huh, without uh -huh. students, what's your view <sighs> uh, yeah, as someone yeah, yeah, from yeah. the University of Leicester? Well, someone from a university who's also got a son just gone to university and, and who's been looking at these data extensively the last few days. Um, it's, uh, I, I think it's almost um, purely academic discussion because today that virus is spreading like crazy in universities. Uh, Manchester Day today reported 40, 40 percent of students in two halls were, were positive for the virus. So I think we have to accept that actually it is going, it is going to spread amongst younger people, whatever we decide to do or the government decide to do. Um, and then the trick is how we protect the old people. Well, now, I don't understand what you've just said. So the, mm -hmm. we, we've, heard, we've heard you talk about the benefits of a lockdown, of how it would yeah. undoubtedly drive down the infection rate. So yeah. why would we just ignore or take as read or say, well, look, it's going to happen anyway with a cohort of 18, 19 and 20 year olds? Why would no, we I'm not lock not, no, them no, down no, for no, 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 two or three no, weeks? It's, exactly. It's, it's a question of degree, right? Um, I'm not saying that we just let the students all intermingle and, and let them all get infected. I'm saying they are going to mingle to a degree anyway. There will be more infections amongst the students. And today it's already at very high levels. So, Would you lock them down? Uh, lock them down. The same as the rest of the country? Yeah. Um, oh, yes. Yes, so I see what you mean now. If we impose things like... I. Uh, um, you know, travel and um, all the other aspects of, of lockdowns, how many times you can go out per day, all of these things. Yes, of course, they're parts of the, the, the society. They would be sub subject to the same rules. And, and final question before we go to the news. Uh, Duncan Robertson, you don't get off scot-free with a question about students either. So you're from Lockford University. Here's the bit I don't understand. I keep on looking at the actual legislation that the government has created. And, and part of that legislation... Um, it, it, it is written so that it prevents a certain number of households mixing with each other, right? So, mm. but the definition of a household does not change. There is no exception written in the legislation for students, right? It, it just, it, it, 
it, there is absolutely no exception written. And, and, and yet in different nations in the UK, for example, where I live in Northern Ireland, from the First Minister down, Arlene Foster, she has accepted that students who are living in, you know, a household in a student area, five or six of them in a house during the week, are allowed to go home at weekends to a different household. How are four or five or six students living in the same home not defined in law as a household? And how are they not travelling to a different household when they go home to mum and dad? I don't understand it. Well, I, I think that's very, you know, that you're not alone in that. Uh, you know, the whole point is uh, these statutory instruments are sort of uh, put out half an hour before they come into law. And uh, once again, they're sort of, you know, what's happening, I think, is, is you know, the government or their advisors are basically looking at things. what's acceptable, what's socially acceptable, what is the best, what is the nicest thing we can do. But of course, that's not really helping. Uh, it, it's a short term measure. It's, you know, all these things are discussed. They're either sort of briefed to the papers or will happen in a couple of days or weeks time, rather like the ones we're talking about now. Um, and I think, you know, the other thing about students is, of course, we're talking about this R number. And the um, Office for National Statistics is quite an important thing about estimating the R number. And the important thing with that is it doesn't include students in halls of residence. Should it? Well, uh, so the, st the statisticians would say not, because the idea is you're meant to have a representative sample and it's meant to be consistent. But the point is, you know, R is not looking quite as high as it should be because you're excluding students in these, um, these halls of residence, especially first years. And if you think about what the R is in those communities, it might be about six, right? So, you know, overall, I think we're underestimating this R value. And I do have one final, final question, because I've got to go to the news. But again, Professor Anthony Brooks, from what I've heard from both of you tonight, would there be any logic in the very simple message because students, the, the infection rate between students is absolutely relatively high compared to the rest of us in a population. A simple message for those of us who are older, vulnerable in whatever way, should we actually be trying to stay further away, more careful out on the street in society from young people as anyone else? Yes. Yeah. If, if I told you there was a city in the country that had a very high rate of infection, I think a lot of old people would stay away from that. So equally, if I say though younger people, you know, sort of 18 to 24, have a very high rate of infection today, you, know, you probably want to keep a bit more distance than you so, would normally. So, and, and just basically, so if I'm walking into Tesco's, Asda, wherever, and, and I see a shopping aisle and it's got, uh, you know, young people standing in it and another shopping aisle has got middle-aged people stopping in it, I'm less likely to be infected if I avoid the aisle, statistically, if I avoid the aisle with younger people. Right? Less likely, but, but just walking past someone in, in a supermarket, the risk is so trivial. You know, it might be just slightly smaller in the case you say, but it's really being in close proximity to people for, for extended okay. periods that, that cause infection. Listen, I've loved you two on tonight. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Anthony Brooks, Dr Duncan Robertson, thank you. 0885 909 693.